So now in this uh, last session, we're really going to talk about how to do format preserve encryption for general formats, formats that we care about. So I know, you know, it was the lunch break. Basically, you remember nothing that we talked about. So what do you need to remember? So first of all, that we're talking about format preserve encryption. We want to preserve the format of the message. It's useful for applications. We saw all kinds of security definitions. You don't remember what they mean, but it's OK. When we'll need it, we'll talk about it again. And we have constructions for integral and almost integral domains that can preserve the, the domain. And we're interested in doing general format preserve encryption. So the first thing I want to talk about is how to do that in general. How can we reduce this to a, pro a problem that we already know how to solve? Then I'm going to talk about kind of the natural solution of how to do format preserve encryption. We'll see insecurities. We'll try to learn from that. And then we'll talk about the format preserve encryption schemes that we now have these days for general formats. So for the first technique, let's say we want to encrypt social security numbers. Now, basically, these are nine-digit strings, but there are additional constraints. So for example, a social security number can't start with the sequence 666. And even though this might sound crazy, the reason is that 666 is the devil's uh, number. So no one wants their social security number to start with 666. I know it's crazy, but it's true. So how can we do format preserving encryption for social security numbers? We know how to do this if we had, we just wanted to encrypt nine digit strings without these additional constraints. So here's an idea. Let's just use the encryption. Do you hear me? No. Like the dramatic effect is real. <laughs> That's true. Right. It has worked before, but this time. Okay. So we're just going to use format preserving encryption for nine digit strings, and we're going to encrypt and hope for the best. Now, what happens? We might not get a valid social security number. So now, what do we do? We'll encrypt again. Permutation. So there are no two keys that give you the same permutation. 
And I'm starting out with an ideal FPE for M, M prime because I don't want our problems to come from the fact that we started with a bad FPE. The question is, if you start with a good FPE, would you get through cycle walking a good scheme? So now we have an encryption algorithm, ECW, on M, which is you encrypt and you repeat this until you get something which is again an M. And it turns out that if you pick your key at random and you started with an ideal FPE for M prime, you would get a random permutation on M. And this was shown by Black and Rogaway in 2002. And to do that, you know, if we said that we started out with, um, you know, you choose a key, you get some permutation. And then you do this cycle walking and you get some permutation over M, the, the smaller domain, then it's enough to show that the same number of keys would be mapped to uh, each permutation. So every permutation over M is induced by the same number of keys. So the probability of landing on that specific permutation is the same for all the, the permutations that we might get. So the question is, you know, we have some permutation over M, the smaller domain. How are we going to get it if we're starting out with some permutation over M prime? And the answer is that if we have some, let's say we have this permutation, and we have some um, permutation over a larger, do larger domain that contains one additional point x, where can this x be on the permutation? It has to somehow satisfy this structure of this pi. It has to satisfy these cycles of pi. What do I mean? So let's say we're looking at, at this x, maybe this x is right over here. So will we get this permutation pi if we do cycle walking? We would, because we're starting at this red point. We map it to the yellow point. The yellow point is not an n. We repeat. We get to this red point, which was its image under pi to begin with. And this is not specific to this point. We could put it anywhere on this cycle. And also, you know, anywhere on the other cycle, anywhere on any cycle, you know, if you just put it on the cycle, it just means you're going to repeat what to encrypt twice, but you would land where you would land anyway. And actually, there's another location where we can add it. We can put this yellow point on a cycle of its own. It's mapped to itself. We're never starting with the yellow point because it's outside of our message space. So if we never start there, we're never going to land at this cycle here. So how many options do we have to add this, this uh, element x to our permutation? Or generally, let's say we had a permutation over m union x. How many would give us back this permutation? Only permutations in which this yellow point is somewhere on the cycle or a cycle on, of its own. And if you think of it, you know, the number of places you can put this x is just the length of all cycles, the accumulative length of all cycles, plus the additional option of putting it here. So, you know, the length of all cycles, that's just the number of points in M, plus one. So it doesn't matter what permutation you want on M, the number of keys that would give it, would induce this permutation, is the size of your message domain plus one. Now what happens if you have more points in M prime, more than one point, then you just repeat by induction. So this uh, idea of doing cycle walking really is a secure way of getting encryption for, let's say, social security numbers if we know how to do that for nine-digit uh, strings. Yes? But if I always start from M prime, is it, am I assured that I will get one on M? But what if I start from red and I never come back? Okay, so the question was, how do I know that I will land back? If I started with a point in M, I will land back at a point in M. And the answer is because um, these, this pi really, any encryption algorithm is a permutation, induces a permutation. A permutation has these cycle cycles, right? Because no cycles means you need to have two messages mapped to the same ciphertext. So if we have, you know, we have some cycle. We start with a point in M. This is our original message. The worst you can do is you walk all through the cycle, get back to your original point. But you know that on the cycle you have a valid message, which is the message you started with. Okay, so for sure you're going to stop. You might stop at the original message. The question is, you know, would you always stop on the original message? Probably not. 
No, no, it assumes that every permutation, that every key induces a unique permutation. So what I'm trying to prove is that I won't have all keys mapped to the same permutation. I want to say that uh, um, a good cipher never induces all permutations because you only have, like, two to the n possibilities for the key, right? And you have two to the two to the n or whatever number of permutations. Um, so the question is, you know, out of the, this smaller domain of permutations that might be induced, are you going to land at a random one? Or are you going to be always mapped to the same permutation? Like you're going to have 10,000 keys mapping you to the same permutation. So what we're saying here is that you would get, you know, when you uh, reduce yourself to a smaller domain, you kind of shrink down permutations. But what you would do is you would shrink the same number of permutations to each pi on n. So there is no one permutation that would appear a lot now. So we're still, again, I'm not going to get, okay, I see what I think is confusing you. I don't get a random permutation out of all possible permutations, but out of the ones that might be induced on M from, uh, from the ones that I started with on M prime, I get a random one, okay? So if I'm looking at the set of permutations that are kind of, um, um, that I reduce to, then I get a random one in it. So the slide, th this same random permutation might be a bit kind of, uh, the, the thing that is confusing you. So it's not an entirely random permutation. No. That's impossible. Only if, so, so this assumes, this here assumes that this permutation is at all induced by one permutation, okay? So, yeah. So thanks for the comment. Okay, so it's secure. Is it efficient? What are we paying for doing cycle walking? So what we're paying is that for one encryption call for you know, encrypting a message in M, we do multiple calls, we perform multiple calls to E prime. How many? It's roughly the ratio between M, the domain we care about encrypting, and M prime, the domain that we know how to encrypt. So these are, you know, we're, we're doing encryption several times, and encryption is usually a, a heavy operation. So that might not be too good, but I just want to note that if you're worried that you might do timing attacks, so you, you look at how long it takes to encrypt, and then you say, okay, so it took like 10, we, we performed an encryption 10 times. Maybe you can use that to realize what the message is, but then you can't. Because the thing is that your first encryption, right, the first image that you got should be random, should look like random, because you started out with a good cipher for n prime. So this fact that you do repeated encryptions is not problematic for security, it's problematic for efficiency. And there is no actual bound. You know, we might be very unfortunate and start with a red point that the cycle is going to be really, really long. And we'll see examples later on where this actually occurs. But kind of in theory, this should not occur a lot. Because if we're starting out with a good format preserving encryption for n prime, then, you know, what's the probability that the, sec the first image is going to land outside of M? So this should be like the, the size of M over the size of M prime, the average bound. Now, let's say this failed. What's the probability that the second image didn't land lands outside of M? So again, that's the average. And the probability that this is going to happen for a very, very long cycle, many, many times, is very small. So in general, this average bound should be the right bound. So if we'll sum up this first technique of cycle walking, the main drawback is that we do these multiple encryptions. And you know, in general, we can take the, we can always encrypt like bit strings, so we can always take the, the format to be at most twice as large as the one we started with, and we repeat encryption twice on average. So that sounds pretty good. But you know, if you always repeat your encryption twice, then that's not very good. So when it hurts, we would like to not do um, uh, cycle walking. 
The pros, of course, are that we can now use like generalized Feistel networks, uh, schemes that we're kind of convinced of their security and we're happy with them. But we'll see later on that actually you can do the same without doing cycle walking. So we would like to avoid cycle walking when possible. And if you think about it for a minute, you know, we wanted to encrypt, let's say, integral domains. And we spent all this time talking about generalized Feistel when basically we could just take classic Feistel over a larger domain and do cycle walking. So why didn't we? Because we'll see later on that these generalized Feistel are going to be the basis of how we do format preserve encryption for general domains. And we don't want to repeat this encryption time, this encryption twice every time we encrypt. So because you know our code in some sense is going to spend 90% of the time encrypting, then we would like to make this encryption as fast as possible. So when we're dealing with this integer FPE schemes, we really want to make them as fast as possible. We don't want to do cycle walking, which is why we kind of really tailored uh, uh, the, the Feistel networks to work with integral domains. So this is cycle walking. This was the first technique. The second technique basically takes general formats and says, OK, let's reduce them to designing format preserving encryption for integral domains. And this uh, technique is called rank then in cipher. And this is what we do. So the first thing is we take our general format, looks something like this, I don't know, and we order it arbitrarily. So now we order these eight elements in this manner, and we have some ranking procedure that, given a message, finds its location in this ordering. How do we encrypt? So let's say we want to encrypt this trapezoid. So the first thing we'll do is we'll take this ranking procedure and use it to find the location of the trapezoid in this ordering. So this is going to be, let's say, 4. Now we're going to take this number 4 and encipher it using the integer FPE encryption uh, algorithm and get some number in this domain 1 to 8. So let's say we got the number 1. And now we're going to use the reversed algorithm of the ranking algorithm, which is called unrank to find which uh, message is mapped to the first, the first location. So let's say it's this teardrop. And now the ciphertext of the trapezoid will be the teardrop. So again, to encrypt, what we would do is we would start with our message, find its location, encrypt the location, and then take this new number that we got and kind of reverse engineer, find which message uh, is located in that location. And this ranking procedure is just a way of reducing this general uh, message domain to uh, um, inter an integral domain. So it's not meant to add privacy or security. It shouldn't be something private. It can be completely public. And what we get is that if you're able to break, if you're able, given this C, to find out what this message M is, then since it basically means that given C, you can find J because the ranking procedure is, is completely um, public. And you know what M is because you were able to figure it out. So you also know what I is. This means you were able to, br to break this integer FP encryption algorithm. So if you can't do that, if you have a secure integer FPE scheme, then you can't break this as for efficiency, we're doing here three operations. First, we're doing the rank, then we're encrypting, then we're computing the reverse, the unrank. So this would be efficient if we know how to do this ranking and unranking efficiently. And the main challenge is how to do this efficiently, to design procedures that would really allow us to do this mapping efficiently. And in the Bilar et al. paper, they have this kind of meta technique of how to do this for a, a restricted class of, of um, formats. Okay, so what we're interested in is constructing format preserving encryption schemes for general formats. So one scheme that will take like social security numbers, credit card numbers, dates, names, addresses, you name it, and encrypt it. And the main tool we're going to use is this rank then in cipher idea of reducing encrypting our format to encrypting integral domains. And the main challenges are, well first we've already mentioned we need to design ranking and unranking procedures. And the second thing is we need to represent formats because our scheme is going to be able to encrypt all these various formats and we need to kind of specify what's the <coughs> format of the message.
So this is also something we discuss. You get a nine-digit string. Is it a social security number? Is it just the number? Is it whatever? I don't know. So let's try to think about, you know, what would be the simplest solution? And this was the solution, the only solution that was available until like two years ago. And it was suggested in two patents in 2011. And the idea is that we would represent formats as the union over simpler entities, simpler domains. So the messages are just strings. That's how we think of them. And we take our format and we divide it into subsets of strings. Each subset is going to share the same, have the same length and have the same sets of characters in each location. So what do I mean? So let's say we're trying to encrypt the format of names. So that's a valid name. We need to define it. But let's say it's like one to four words. Madonna is a valid name. Each of these words are separated by, by a space. And the word is an uppercase letter and then one to 15 lowercase letter, letters. So what are, our, what are these subsets? So the first subset, M1, contains like the shortest names. So it's one word, two letters, like Al. The second format, M2, contains names with one word, three letters, like Tal. And so on and so forth. We get to like M15 is names with one word, 16 letters, like Muthurama Krishna. Then the next one, M16, is going to contain all the strings, all the names, with two words, each with two letters, like El Al, which is the uh, Israeli uh, uh, airline. Now, M16 contains strings of length 5, but it's different than M5, which also contains strings of length 5. What's the difference? In M5, in the first location, we have an uppercase letter. And then all the other locations, we have lowercase letters. What about M16? First location, uppercase letter. Second location, lowercase letter. Third location, space. Always. Because that's the only thing that can appear there. Because we're talking about two, two uh, uh, names that have two words in them. Then third location is an uppercase letter. Um, not third. Fourth location is uppercase letter. And then fifth location is lowercase letter again. So these two formats, even though they have these two kind of subsets, even though they, they share the same length, they're completely different. Now how do we encrypt? So the thing is that we would encrypt each format separately, each subset separately. So this means that we're going to encrypt the strings in M1 into strings in M1. So the name Al could be encrypted to any other name with one word, two letters in it. And L Al can be encrypted to any name with two words, each with two letters, and so on. And the way in which you do it, the way in which you kind of find the location of a string in this small subset of strings, you do it finding the, by finding the lexicographic ordering of it. And the kind of way, an example of how you do it is in your um, printouts in the next slide, but I'm not going to go over it because really it's not very important right now. Okay, now everyone's looking at this not very important way of doing lexicographic order. Okay, so, so what's the problem? You know, there are various problems, but I want to focus on the problem of security. And the problem here is that if you think of it, we're encrypting every subset of, of strings separately. This means that we're not preserving just the format, but we're preserving kind of cosmetic properties that are specific to the message. So here's an example, and this example is different than the one you have in your uh, printout. So let's say we have this encryption John Doe. So this can encrypt Jane Lee. Why is it? Because both names have two words and each has um, the same number of letters as the other one. But John Doe cannot be the encryption of this name Johnny Smith because we know that in the plain text here, the fifth location here has to be a space. Whereas in Johnny Smith, the fifth location is just a lowercase letter. So these are different subsets. These belong to different subsets of strings. So this means that if we know, you know, that, um, that one of these two names was encrypted, either Jane Lee or Johnny Smith, then we know what the plain text was. And this seems like, you know, it's a stupid, trivial example, but actually this is the core of the problem with this scheme and the reason that this scheme is insecure. 
And it's insecure both in theory and in practice. In practice, what we did is we just ran experimental results on actual um, databases. And this is a joint work with uh, Muhammad, um, Muhammad Baham, which is sitting here, and Boris Rosenberg from uh, uh, IBM Haifa. And basically, we used the, the length of the ciphertext and these specific message-specific properties, like how many words you have, how many letters do you have in each word, to kind of try and track down specific individuals in the database. And we were able to track down individuals with quite alarming probabilities. So two thirds of the population, you can narrow them down from one million records to two records, which is kind of like, it's worse than not encrypting. You're telling someone it's okay, your data is encrypted, you know, like you have security, but then when you just look at the, the ciphertext, you basically know who that person is. So I'm not going to talk about that, but I have the graphs with me if you want to see them later. What I want to talk about is the theory behind why this is insecure. And the idea is to show that the scheme is insecure according to the weakest notion of security that we know, which is message recovery. This means that it's insecure according to all of the security notions that we talked about. But intuitively, you know, message recovery, the only thing it said was the ciphertext does not completely reveal the message. So if you don't have this, if you don't have this security guarantee, this means that the ciphertext reveals the message. So of course you understand that this scheme would not be secure. Yes? to a larger subset of strings. Yes. So the question is, so, so that's the goal. And to do that, you need to do two things. One is to be able to rank, which is, again, for this specific um, uh, case, it might be simple. The second is, how do you represent what a valid name is? Okay. So we'll get to it. There are solutions. But this is, this is it sounds like, OK, you're saying, why are we doing it this way? Until two years ago, this is how we did it. These were the patents. These were the schemes that people used. OK. I don't know. But this is the, I mean, even understanding, I'm not sure there was the understanding that this is a bad way to go. OK? Like, this, the, the analysis of the scheme is a new result. It's from last year. So the security analysis. OK. So I want to show that this scheme really is uh, message recovery insecure. Now, that was before lunch, so I know you don't remember anything. So let's go back to you know, what message recovery is. Now, this is what we talked about, but actually, I just want to point out the things that I will need. Okay, So you don't need to remember the entire definition. What you need to remember is we're comparing a real world execution with an ideal world execution. In the real world, the adversary can choose a favorable distribution over the messages. Okay. And then she gets back the ciphertext. OK? And she needs to guess what the message is. In the ideal world, the adversary has, the ideal world adversary has to choose the same distribution, doesn't get back the ciphertext. And it can make the same number of queries as the real world adversary, which means that if the real world adver adversary makes no queries, the ideal world adversary can't make any queries. And the ideal world adversary also needs to guess what the message is. And we measure you know, the, the advantage of the real world adversary as the probability that it guesses correctly minus the probability that the best ideal world adversary guesses correctly. So this is what we need to remember from the definition. So let's show that this scheme is, is insecure. So for a warm up example, let's think about sparse formats. What do I mean? I mean that each message has its own unique length. Now, this simplification-based format preserver encryption scheme does all kinds of things, but actually the only thing I would need is the fact that it preserves the length of the message. So now, because of that, when you get back the ciphertext, you know what the length of the message is. 
Now, you probably can already see the ending. Because these links are unique in this sparse format, this reveals what the message is. So the adversary now knows how to recover the message. The question is, how are we going to hide it from the ideal world adversary? How are we going to make it hard for the ideal world adversary to guess the answer? So this is how we do it. We just pick the random distribution, the uniform distribution over messages. Remember that the adversary can choose a favorable distribution. Now you get back, as the adversary, you get back the ciphertext. So you know the length of the message. So you know the message. So you don't need to make any encryption queries. You just guess what the message is, and you're always right. What about the ideal world adversary? It can't make any queries. It doesn't get the ciphertext back. It has the uniform distribution over messages. It knows nothing. The best you can do is just guess at random. What's the probability of being correct? One over the number of messages. And if your format grows, then you would always win as the adversary. The um, advantage of the adversary would tend to one as the format grows. So this is the case for sparse formats. What happens if we don't have a sparse format? Then we can sparsify it. We can choose the distribution that is good for us over the message uh, format. So what we would do is for every you know, unique, um, for every possible length, we'll choose one message. And now we'll choose the uniform distribution over this subset of messages. And we're back to the first case. Now, you know, you might ask yourself, okay, maybe we basically reduced it to two messages. So, you know, maybe also the ideal world adversary can easily guess what the message is. The thing is, when we're talking about like names, addresses, you know, the formats that we really care about, if you think of, you know, all valid addresses, they have a lot of possible things. Because you can start with a really short name, a really short city name, you know, really tiny number uh, as a house number stuff like that, and then talk about a really long name, a really long city name, a really large number, house number. So you would get a lot of lengths. And this uh, sparsification attack would still uh, give you a very, very small distinguishing advantage, you know, um, guessing advantage when you're in the ideal world. So theoretically speaking, this scheme is insecure. And I, as I mentioned, also, you know, in practice it's insecure when we look at actual databases. So why are we talking about it? We're talking about it because of you know, what we can learn from it. And the thing is that we need to invest time in these questions you know, of how to represent formats and how to rank formats. Because if you don't, if you, you know, go beyond and say, okay, we're already preserving the, the, the format, maybe we'll preserve a little bit of you know, properties of the message. No, that's not good. So what do we want from FPEs in general, you know, what can we hope for? So the first thing we want is functionality, and efficiency comes as part of as functionality. So we want, you know, a simple method of representing formats. We want an efficient way of doing this ranking and unranking, this reduction to integral domains. And we want for security to preserve only the format of the message and hide all these message-specific properties, like the number of words in the name and the number of letters in each word, etc. And, you know, if you think about it, this was our problem with the previous scheme, the security. But I think the reason we had a problem with security was because of functionality. We didn't have a simple method of representing the format in an inc inclusive way, so we kind of separated it. And we didn't know how to do this um, efficient ranking and unranking for the entire format. So we kind of did it for small subsets within themselves. And this was what caused the message-specific properties being preserved and the loss of security. OK, so this is what we want. Do we have it? So in the last two years, two um, uh, concurrent works proposed two different schemes for doing format preserving encryption for general formats. And these schemes are, they achieve the same thing, but their design is, is different and the, the goals are different in some sense. So in the goals, I mean whether it's designed for developers or for the end users. And for design, I mean how you represent formats and how you rank them. So the first one is libfte by Lu Chaupedal. This is a developer-oriented scheme in which you represent formats using regular expressions, regexes, and you rank it using automatons. And the, and the second scheme is a joint work with Muhammad and, um, and Bowie's 
called GFP. It's a user-oriented scheme. We represent formats in a kind of building them from the bottom up in a natural method, something your grandfather could do. And we use the standard method of rank then in Cypher. And I hope I'll have time to discuss both, but I'll start with libft. So let me just say that libft does more than format preserving encryption, but because we're discussing format preserving encryption, I'm just going to talk about that part of the scheme. Now, why is it developer oriented? So they support all kinds of schemes. So you can do all kinds of, you can do format preserving encryption schemes in all kinds of ways. And you need a developer to kind of choose which scheme to use. And if you think about it, you also need a developer to represent the format. I don't think your grandfather can write a regex, right? So you need a developer to do that. And the structure is that you represent formats using regular expressions. But you know, regular expressions can also capture an infinite number of strings. And we want all our slices to be finite. So these regular expressions are between some minimal and maximal parameters. So you have all strings that satisfy the constraints here between length and min and n max. And they do ranking using automatons, and they do they use the um, the underlying integer FPE scheme as FFX for bits. So it's a scheme for almost integral domains. It cannot capture all, you know, all um, uh, integral domains, only these almost integral domains. If you have a problem and your domain can't be written, you know, as m to the power of n, then you do cycle walking. And I think the main kind of um, conceptual um, contribution is how to do ranking and unranking. And let's talk about this a little bit. So the idea is, you know, what you have in your hand, your format preserving encryption, uh, your uh, format, sorry, is a regular expression. And you need to find a way of ranking regular expressions. So ranking, we talked about this. This is a bijection from your message space M to the integral domain one to your, the size of your message space. And this is really helpful when it's easy to find this bijection. But sometimes, you know, it's hard. And actually what uh, they notice in libft is that sometimes it's an overkill. Sometimes you don't really need to map exactly. What do I mean? I mean it's enough to do something which is a little bit relaxed. Instead of mapping your message domain into an integral domain of the same size, map it into something a little bit larger. <coughs> Why would this be easier? Because now you just need a relaxed ranking algorithm that for every message in your domain, it maps it, you know, injectively to some number in this larger domain. So it might be easier because you're mapping into a larger domain. You need to have a way of going back. So you need some kind of relaxed unranking algorithm, which given any number in your larger domain, maps it surjectively to some message. And of course you want this to be reversible. If you take a message in your domain, you do relaxed ranking, you do the reverse, you get back the message you started with. And that would be enough. So now that we have this idea in mind, what do they do? So to explain what they do a little bit, yeah, sorry. This is not your because when you're doing, when you're decrypting, you're thinking, I'm doing unranking and then ranking. But actually what you're doing is you're... something in M. 
Okay? So I, I agree that it looks like uh, no, no, weird, but... Okay, so maybe, so... I, 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 um, maybe the abstraction, you know, I'll, I'll grant you that. Maybe the abstraction is a little bit too abstract. Like maybe you can give a counter example to, to the abstraction. For sure the algorithms work because I know how they work and it's one way. So what I'm saying is let's take it offline because I don't want to get stuck on this. Okay. So, so we were here. So. I want to use either rank or relaxed rank to rank regular expressions. Now, this is done using automatons. So I have to give you like a very, very br brief crash course on what an automata theory. So, you know, automatons and regular says these are a way of representing sets. So you might be used to thinking them of, as representing languages. But it's a way of representing sets. Now, how do you represent the set? Automatons are basically graphs. So each message corresponds to some path in this graph. So you represent your message through this path. And you have two ways of representing, like two kinds of automatons. One is deterministic finite automaton, or a DFA. And one is a non-deterministic finite automaton, or NFA. And regexes are equivalent to automatons. What do I mean? I mean that if you have a regex, you can move to an NFA, a non-deterministic automaton, in uh, linear time. So you have a linear blow up in your object that you're wor working with. You can also take a regex and transform it into a deterministic finite automaton. But this might take exponential time. It might cause exponential blow up. And it's um, sometimes inherent. Sometimes you can't move to a DFA that has size uh, smaller than exponential. So in their uh, 2009 paper, Bilar et al. suggests kind of a, not exactly a way of doing ranking, but an idea of how you could do ranking if um, you could get a DFA. So what does this mean? You have a regex. You construct a DFA from it. Now you run a polynomial time algorithm on the DFA. What's the size of the DFA? It might be exponential in the size of the regex you started with. That's too inefficient. So that's a no-go. But what uh, they show in LibFTE is that you can do relaxed ranking from an NFA, from the non-deterministic finite automaton. Now, I don't have time to explain how they do this, but it's a very nice idea. The problem in NFAs is that Unlike the deterministic automaton, where every message corresponds to one path in your graph, in a non-deterministic automaton, every message might correspond to many paths in the graph. So basically, the question is, how do you find one such path? And finding one such path, that's a very, very large graph that we need to traverse. But they find they show a way of kind of implicitly holding, storing this graph and traversing it while only having an implicit representation of it. So it's a very nice idea. And then what they do is they offer you to do ranking either based on uh, deterministic automatons or on non-deterministic automatons. And we'll see why, why it's important. OK. So this is basically how they work. You represent your formats using uh, regular expressions. And then you do ranking based on automatons. And just a little bit about the tools that you have in, in LibFTE. So I said you have various schemes that you can use. You can use also randomized uh, encryption. You can do ranking based on deterministic or non-deterministic automatons. And you have this tool, which is called the Configuration Assistant, that is supposed to help the developer choose which scheme to use. And which scheme to use, that depends on the parameters that you, um, uh, that you specify. Like what's the running time, the performance constraints that you have, what's the format that you want to encrypt. And then the assistant returns, you know, performs all kinds of tests and returns an answer as to which schemes you can use. And you need to choose the appropriate one. So it looks something like this. You specify what the format is. You specify the minimal and maximal length parameters. Then you get back, sorry, the valid <coughs> schemes here. And this P here stands for FPE, Format Preserving <coughs> Encryption. And then you have like N or D, where N means your ranking is going to be based on non-deterministic automatons. D, D means it's based on deterministic automatons. 
dollar means it's randomized. And then you have these performance estimates here of the schemes. Now one thing to know about uh, libft is what is going to be your, the performance of encryption and decryption. So that depends. First of all, it depends on the scheme you choose, which makes sense. But the second thing is it depends on the way in which you chose to represent the format, the specific regular expression you chose. Now that doesn't sound too good. So, you know, let's say the configuration system returns, you know, comes back with this estimate of really, really bad performance. Why do you get that performance? Is it because you chose a bad regex or because you're just trying to encrypt a very difficult format? And in general, it's not clear how to choose the best scheme and representation of the format that would kind of optimize, secure, uh, optimize efficiency. Yes? Exactly. So I, I would just give the example that they give in their paper. So here we have the same format, but represented in two, using two different regexes. And the second representation is 10,000 times slower than the first representation. And the reason is that they're not using uh, FPEs for integral domains, but rather for almost integral domains. This incurs cycle locking, and they have to repeat the, the encryption. This average length of the cycle is like 700. So you're repeating encryption 700 times. So if you had the bad luck of starting with the second representation, that's not so good. But I will say that for the example they give here, if you just look at this representation, then their configuration assistant would tell you, you know, if you would use deterministic automatons to do ranking and unranking rather than non-deterministic automatons, then you wouldn't get this cycle walking and you wouldn't incur this very um, long encryption uh, uh, time. And the reason that here deterministic uh, automatons are good is because for this specific regex, you can find a more efficient uh, representation as a DFA. So this is all I have time to say about libfte, but I think the main problem with um, uh, libfte right now, the main issue is this non-uniformity of representing formats, that your performance depends on the specific representation that you chose. Okay, so let's move on to GFP. So this is a user-oriented scheme. It's designed to be part of a larger scheme that would be uh, uh, used by users. Encryption and decryption are done using Renton and Cypher, and you can either base it on almost integral domains <coughs> and on integral domains, and each has their pros and cons, and I think I won't, get time, won't have time to get into it, but I'll just mention here that the only schemes that really have proven security are these schemes for for integral domains. So if you want proven security and you want to avoid cycle walking, then you have to use these schemes. And we already mentioned that they factor the domain size and that's inefficient for large, um, for large domains. So this will cause a problem when we're dealing with really large domains. The main challenge for us is, you know, how to represent formats in a user-friendly way such that your grandfather can do that. And the idea is to construct formats from the bottom up. So we're starting with some building blocks, which we call primitive, which we call primitives. These are the basic building blocks. Usually they represent um, formats that have really kind of a rigid set of constraints that define them, like social security numbers, credit card numbers, strings of an exact length, and stuff like that. But we can also represent less rigid formats in this way, like strings of variable length. And then we have a set of operations that you can use to construct more complex formats from simpler formats. So for example, of our building blocks, we can uh, have the format of all uppercase letters by just you know, uh, fixed length strings of length one. We can have a format of one to 15 lowercase letters. This is a variable length string. Um, and we can have the format of all valid social security numbers. And what kind of operations do we have? So we can concatenate two formats. So for example, if you want a word, an uppercase letter followed by one to 15 lowercase letters, you concatenate the uppercase letter format with the lowercase letter format. 
We can also concatenate with some delimiter character that kind of separates these um, uh, concatenations, like spaces if we need to, and stuff like that. And then maybe you want to have one format that repeats itself some variable number of times. So for example, the format of, name, of names is one to four words separated by a space. So we have that uh, operation as well. And finally, you wa might want to kind of unite um, different formats. So for example, if you want a format that allows users to identify themselves, either using their social security number or their name, then you can just um, uh, define the format, which is the union of the format of names and of social security numbers. Something a little bit more complicated. Let's say we want to represent addresses. So an address is like the name, the house number, the street name, the city name, the zip and the state. So you know a name, a city name, a street name, those are all names. We already know how to get that. A house number, it's just a number in some integral domain. That's also something that is easy to represent. We've already discussed this when we talked about integer FPs. The zip is just a five-digit string. The state might seem a little bit problematic. How do we represent you know, a state? But there are only 52 states, right? So this is a US address, for example. So we can just take this set of all the valid set of uh, state abbreviations and just have this be our format. And this is OK because we only have 52 of them. So this is a really small um, uh, format. And now how do we get an address? We just concatenate the person's name with the house number with the street and the city and the zip and the state. And we get an address. So this gives us the representation of the format. Now how do we do encryption? By reducing it to, um, to integer encryption. And to do that, we need to somehow rank our messages. So what we do is we define ranking operations for primitives, for the building blocks, and for operations. Now if we want to encrypt uh, some uh, uh, complicated format, what we do is we divide it into the substrings that correspond to the sub the subformats. So let's say if we have the address, we kind of divide it into substrings, which is the person's name, the house number, the street name, etc. Each of these substrings are sent to um, the subformat to which it belongs. So the name is sent, the, the person's name is sent to the name format. It's ranked there, and then somehow we glue these ranks together using ranking for operations. So let's see an example of how we rank concatenation. Let's say this is our format. It's the concatenation of two formats, F1 and F2, and they're separated by this delimiter character. So we're going to have some, let's say, C++ class that represents this format. Now it gets a message to encrypt. And the way in which we define the operations guarantees that by Parsing the message, you know, traversing it once from beginning to end, we'd be able to parse it into its ingredients, so into two substrings, M1 that has the format F1 and M2 that has the format F2. Now what would we do? We would send M1 and M2 to the subformats F1 and F2, let them rank these substrings. We get back R1, R2, now we need to somehow unite them into one rank for M. So this is basically how we do it. We take R1, which is the contribution of M1, and we sum it with R2, the contribution of M2, but scaled in some sense. So this is a generalization of how you would do, uh, you, could, you would compute the lexicographic ordering of a string. But if you didn't really follow what we're doing here, the important thing is the following. First, this is efficient. We can do this. This is no problem. This runs really fast. And second, what I computed here, this rank R of M is unique. I would be able to recover M. And, it's, and this is the location of M in relation to all the strings in this format F. So I'm not mapping M, ranking M, and encrypting M in relation to some small subset of strings. I'm ranking it and encrypting it in relation to all the, the format. So if this F was the format of all valid names, I would map the name that I got to any other valid name, regardless of how many words were in it and how many letters I had in each word. Okay, so, um, so I would just, okay, 
So I just want to say, you know, kind of give you a teaser, though I wouldn't have time, I won't have time to talk about it, that our scheme supports these integer FPE schemes, the ones that need to factor M. And these schemes are inefficient when we're t dealing with large formats, which is what we're dealing with when we're talking about names, addresses, etc. And if we want to support these schemes and know what kind of security we're getting, we have to keep the formats small. And this basically means that if we have a format that is too large, we need to divide it. Now this might seem, you know, okay, this is what we did before, right? We divided the format, we got kind of um, uh, very bad security, we didn't get any security, so what are we, why are we doing this? So the idea is that instead of dividing the format into subsets according to kind of properties that are specific to the message, we would divide it according to the structure of the format. And I'm going to leave you with that. I'll just say that this is the main challenge of how to do, how to divide the format, but we're able to do that. And dividing the format really introduces a lot of complications in how we do ranking and unranking, but we can still solve these problems efficiently. And we can also kind of estimate what kind of security you're losing here. And we performed all kinds of experiments, and we saw that if you do this um, uh, division in a smart way, you look at what it means to, to be, to have this specific format, and you, do, you use that to do the, um, to do the division, then you really don't lose a lot of security. And again, I'd be happy to discuss this offline with um, whoever wants. Okay, so let's summarize just these FPEs for general formats. So, uh, so we had two schemes, right? One was libfte, one was gfpe. So both of them use Rankin and Cypher. libfte supports currently FFX, the one to become standard, but generally any FPE for almost integral domains. GFPE supports right now FFX and FE1, but generally any FPE for integral or almost integral domains. LibFTE is designed for developers, GFPE for the end users. Uh, both do um, deterministic encryption. LibFTE also supports randomized encryption, also supports format transforming encryption. The format representation in libfd is regular expressions. In GFP, it's kind of a bottom-up construction of the format. And, um, and they both have the same kind of security guarantee, which is basically as secure as the integer FP underneath it. Um, I think the main advantage of libfd is that it's open source. You can use it, whereas this GFP is not open source. You need to sit down and write the code. As for performance, uh, the main problem with libfd is that the performance also depends on the way you represent the format because of cycle walking, whereas this doesn't arise in GFP. Also, GFP you can use, you can represent a format using some computation. So let's say you want the format of all prime numbers, then you can just run some formality tests in your C++ class. Whereas how to do that with regular expressions is not very clear. Okay, so let's just summarize these three sessions. So what we wanted was an encryption scheme that preserves the properties of the message. And we saw that this is useful when we're adding encryption on top of existing uh, schemes. So we talked about how to do FPE for integral domains and we talked about the standards or soon to be standards that were submitted to NIST. We talked about techniques for general of how to do format preserving encryption, specifically rank them in Cypher that allows you to basically reduce the task of format preserving encryption on any domain to doing format preserving encryption on integral domains. And we use that to construct or to discuss two schemes for um, general format preserving encryption. And here I'll end. Thank you.